know, I joined the gang because me and my family, we weren't really, you know, clicking the way that I felt that we should be. So a lot of people, you know, they need that family support. They need, you know, to just know that somebody care about them or, you know, so they, they, they can lean on someone's shoulder if they ever feel down or, you know, and that's what the community provides. The reason why I joined the gang uh, was just for that camaraderie, the love of the community. I left home when I was about 15 years old. So it was kind of the community in the streets that raised me. And um, there was that love uh, that I was receiving from the community. You know, I left home not because I was kicked out, but because I didn't want to follow the rules. I didn't want to do what my parents asked me to do. So when I got out, I was able to do what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. Some kids joined for protection. I happened to be one of those kids. Kids join gangs because of issues that uh, people not connecting with, you know, either within the community, with the adults, within the school system. So kids are looking to join gangs because they actually want to belong to something, but for the most part, people mistake joining gangs as something negative, but when we really look at it, we want people to understand that joining gangs to a degree is positive because kids are looking to belong. Get this, son. Niggas about to get their ass beat. I feel like when you when you live in an environment in a concentrated area of poverty um, that's been redlined, um, which means there's no money coming from the outside, no government money kind of really coming into Genesee Street, Jefferson Avenue, the places where black folks live. When the resources, opportunity leave certain neighborhoods and certain areas, um, that's when you kind of see the spike of violence. The way people live versus the way they tend to live or want to live or what they have to do in order to live. Not everybody is fortunate, not everybody can afford to get a job. So if people do one thing, then people do another. Everybody's not fortunate on the same level. So poverty is definitely effective in the community. People don't just go out there and sell drugs for no reason. They don't have money. A lot of people don't understand that when these kids are working at Wegmans and working at McDonald's and stuff like that, when they take those checks home, that helps pay the rent. That helps buy the groceries. That does a lot of things. When you don't have a job like that, all you thinking is, dang, I gotta help my mom. I gotta help my family. And they're gonna do that at whatever whatever cost. And I swear to God, I'm from Chalai Avenue. And all my niggas <laughs> from Chalai Avenue. What? I'm from Chalai Avenue. You don't know where I even came from. You don't know where he came from, she came from. You don't know who they are. You can't just say, because they in the city, they violent. There's people that's out, out, like that's not in the city who violent. You never know. like. Cause we're in Rochester right now, so like Greece, Henrietta, we could be crazy people out there. What we're really talking about was when young people are more inclined to violence, we're talking about black on black crime. That's really the question that they're asking. And listen, that's something that you just really can't argue with me about because I've been analyzing crime in Rochester for years. Like, you know, like it's not, nothing that you can tell me that. Oh, and the one thing that a lot of people don't know is that white on white crime is at the same level as black on black crime. And that's a fact. If you really looking like nationwide, I'll look at FBI statistics and stuff like that. FBI statistics say that when it comes to sexual assault, violence in a relationship, violence in the workplace, black people aren't leading that. Violence in our community is not something that's just unique to Rochester. I think that is something that is um, an effect of a number of different things that play out over, played out over time. Um, some of it has to do with economic status and feeling of hopelessness that some people have. Some of it has to do with a moment in time. I'm upset about this or I'm mad at you about this situation. You disrespected me and therefore I'm going to handle it in a way that's violent. The other part is there is a culture that we have, you know, I think that we've accepted it. And um, we, when you look at reality TV, and the things that um, they have been able to display, the fighting, the cattiness, I don't care which reality TV program you're looking at, it exudes and you know highlights and basically puts out there that it's okay to be violent. And there's no one that's really countering that. Well, Amanda, police say that Moran Wilson of Rochester has been missing under suspicious circumstances since Friday. They were searching a home on Dayton Street related to that investigation and that's when they found a dead body. Neighbors in the Dayton Street neighborhood shaken tonight after police found a body buried in this backyard.
before I give a shout out to my cousin, Moran, you know I love you unconditionally, baby. M. Hey. Oh. Hey. Rest in peace, Morant. One of the real ones. They always the first to go. Whole hood support him. We love you, Morant. Rest in peace. We love you, man. Happy birthday. Rest in peace, Morant. We love you. Yo, we love you, Morant. Y'all hey, 17, bro. Never be another Morant. Shout out to Morant. We love you, Morant. Well, it's in the street, little Boosie in his town. That's right. That's, That's right. a fact. A lot to this, he, he meant a lot to this hood, man, you know what I mean? So, I salute, I, I, I salute young man. Moran, rest in peace, my man. Peace and love, my brother. Peace and love. It's all about peace right now tonight, baby. is showing you know it's not easy for any of us that loved him room flipped up in eight day you know how we do it you know it man love you we've been riding on 24 range rover took a good one away old school Oh, Joke, a lot of jokers ain't taking care of their kids or, or ain't playing no part. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna see some fresh every day, but you're gonna see youngin' definitely fresh too. Like I'm talking about fresher than some grown cats, you know what I mean? But if you work before, you wanna make sure yours is right, and that's what he was doing. You showed me that you love Moran, you know, and I appreciate that. Oh, man, Moran was the truth. He was one of the best people you could ever meet, man, you know what I mean? If you just scan the crowd, look at look, he got everybody out here. You know what I mean? Right, everybody right, loved right. him. Everybody showed him love. Nice he showed everybody out. love. You know what I mean? We celebrating how he lived, not how he died, man. You know what I mean? He lived a great life. Everybody loved him. He could get the shirt off his back if he could. I love you, Daddy. Lord have mercy. He said, I love you, Daddy. That's my little man. Are you part of this? Excuse me? I'm Indie Media. Excuse me, sir. Do you have your do you have a pass with you or are you just part of U of R? Are you actually I'm, media? I'm part of U of R, yeah. Okay, but U of R is not media, right? I'm media. The first time I had police interactions, I was, you know, jumped by like six or seven police officers. I'm 16 at the time. Why should the police do what they want? I feel like they do what they want to do when they want to do it. A lot of people will talk about like the, the blue wall of silence. And I know that's most definitely a real thing where, you know, police look out for each other and they look out for other police officers. Uh, one of my friends, he was murdered, but he, you know, was walking down Genesee Street, the police, they picked him up, he ain't have nothing on him, but his phone, his wallet, and because he didn't have his ID, it gave them permission to search him and stuff like that and basically harass him. Pulled him in the back of the police car and they, they took him and they dropped him off at Charlotte Beach. They took his phone, they took his wallet, his money and stuff and just expected for him to, you know, get away home. That's why we out here. We ain't trying to call for a problem. Like, we gotta stop this. We not calling for no problem. We grieving right now. We ain't calling for no problem. I think when the racial profiling aspect of it is mixed in, um, it, it definitely seems to vilify and criminalize black folks. It's a lot of police officers that's, you know, just like teachers, they're getting paid regardless, so they don't really care, they just doing the job to do it. As an attorney, you look at and you are taught that the scales of justice must balance. That lady justice is blind and she's blind because she's judging you on the facts of the case. It's not about who you are, what you look like, where you come from. But when you work in the court system, 
Um, the people that you see that mostly come before you are people of color. A lot of them are young men of color and the environment that they have grown up in and sometimes creates the, um, the illusion that they are always doing something wrong and that's not true. Make sure you record this sentence to the noobs. Yeah. How they f with black people for no reason. Shit up. We already grieving. My cousin just got fought. Missed it for three days. Record that. Barry. And they ain't fought them yet. You can film all you want. Do it from back there. Let's go. I'm back around up. and walk. I'm back up. Man, all the I'm way back. back. I'm backing back up. up. I'm backing back up. Back off. I think as a community, I think what people really should understand. And this comes from the outside the community oftentimes is that people don't know what police do. They honestly don't realize what it takes to be a police officer, what it takes to be a school resource officer. And what I'm saying is that we have this implicit bias and that's the key term that's trending around the country right now. So we think we know what happens in schools and we don't because most of us don't work in schools. I've been doing a lot of research lately about mandatory minimums um, and there's been a bunch of judges over the last five years that have quit and left the bench um, based on the fact that they felt like their hands were tied. Like there's a young person they know has the potential, um, know has the future, gets into a little trouble and given uh, what's on the books, the punishment that's doled out they feel like was unjust. Um, but like again, can't do anything to change those laws that are in the books. Um, so I think hopefully judges, lawyers, Supreme Court could be advocates um, for the change um, to get away with mandatory minimums um, and really try to like, you know, restructure um, the judicial system and how it looks at people and how it gives out punishment. Uh, I mean, I think the first thing we need to do is listen to young people. In the summer, people are hosting kickball games. Everybody gets together and have fun. Kickball games, the rec centers, like when you're in more safe areas with more people that are above you and they have authority, and they tell you not to hang around gangs and violence, and I think that influences you more. One way we can reduce violence is uh, creating jobs within our community and providing the resources for those young people to continue to maintain those jobs. We work with community partners to really put people to work because I think that um, if you can diffuse the stress that's on people and the trauma that people have through being able to provide for their families, then you can deal with a lot of the animosity or the feeling of hopelessness that they have. And so for me as mayor, that's one part of it. The other part is working with um, the school district, charter schools and improving our educational system and being a support network to them. In school, they, they start off by teaching us, you know, slavery and stuff whenever you ask about black history or they go straight to Martin Luther King and stuff like that. But what about before all of that, you know, when they came and got us from, from Africa and stuff like that, when we was, you know, King Akhenaten, Queen Nefertiti, you know, stuff like that. Queen Thai, you know, they don't teach us about the royal backgrounds that we came from. Outside of the educational system, it's really working with building police community relations. What makes a person a good officer, in my opinion, is to be able to look at yourself and see that community in yourself and, and being able to understand through our own practice, why is it important to keep the pillars of protection, respect, community policing? What are the pillars that continue to drive law enforcement officers to really want to build relationships with people in the community, but in particular our kids? I think young people um, definitely have the, the ear to the street, um, have opinions and thoughts and perceptions that could really change things um, and really get adults looking at things differently. We was able to break those chains and exceed above those barriers. I feel as though violence and everything will reduce so we have respect for not only ourselves, but for our peers as well. There is a saying that hurt people hurt people. And when you are angry, there are certain things that you're willing to do that if you were in a place of peace and happiness, you wouldn't necessarily do. The trauma that we have in, in many of our young people and the effects of that pain and not knowing how to display that pain. Um, and, and the only way that pain comes out is by fighting, is by acting out. 
And if you only get attention when you're doing bad things, even at home or in school, then you're gonna continue to do bad things. We're not responsible for what happened to us as children. Foster homes, gang violence, beatings, witnessing violence. But we have a responsibility to heal ourselves. And that's what I want to leave. We have that responsibility to heal ourselves so that we don't pass this on to another generation. We already know what happened to us. Let's not pass this on to any other generation. This is a homage beat.